Welcome to the Fibromyalgia Podcast with me, Health and Wellness Editor, Verity Clark. Fibromyalgia is a chronic pain condition which goes largely undiagnosed and for which there is currently no cure. Yet in the UK alone, it is estimated that around 1.5 million people are sufferers. Poor diagnosis and zero cure means suffering and silence is a common theme in the chronic pain community. Created in conjunction with the Fibromyalgia magazine, this podcast aims to break this silence because we believe that the more we share, the more ways we will discover for fibromyalgia sufferers to lead happier, healthier lives. We'll be covering and oversharing everything you ever wanted to ask about fibromyalgia, but didn't know who or where to turn to, with conversations with some of the most interesting and thought-leading people, both within as well as outside of the fibromyalgia space, to give you information, insight and inspiration for diagnosing and coping with fibromyalgia. Because even though something is invisible, that doesn't mean it should be kept in the dark. The content on this podcast is for informational purposes only. And because each person is so unique, please consult your healthcare professional for any medical questions. I am delighted to welcome my first ever guest to the Fibromyalgia podcast, Dr. Sunil Arora, a consultant in anaesthetic and pain medicine with a lot of letters after his name. Specialising in acute pain, chronic pain and cancer pain, Dr. Aurora has extensive experience in managing patients suffering from all sorts of short-term and persistent pain. He provides a full range of interventional and non-interventional treatments for painful conditions where surgery is not indicated or not yet needed. His current credentials include being the cancer pain lead for Frimley Park Hospital, sitting on the British Society of Pain Special Interest Group in Education, as well as being a member of the Royal College of Anaesthetists. Dr. Aurora is committed to providing the very best care to his patients, using a holistic, patient-centred approach to ensure the best management plan. Indeed, it was his patients who inspired his most recent pain management adoption, medical cannabis. Dr. Aurora was staunchly against the idea of using the drug to alleviate pain, but he began to change his mind when he noticed that more and more patients were admitting that actually cannabis was the only thing that was helping to relieve their symptoms. Now, Dr. Aurora is something of a medical cannabis champion and was one of the first specialist doctors to prescribe cannabis medicines in the UK. And he is on a mission to spread awareness and reduce the stigma of cannabis for medical use. Thank you so much for joining me this morning, Dr. Aurora, in our kind of third week of lockdown. Um, I know that you have kind of been at the epicentre of the COVID crisis. We even had to reschedule last week because you got called into ICU or onto the wards to be very, very helpful. Um, So how has it been affecting your kind of day-to-day work? So yeah, good morning, everyone. Yeah, sorry, sorry for cancelling. Um, it was a very good so, excuse. Yeah, it was a good excuse. So you couldn't really, you, <laughs> you had no comeback there, did you? Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, for me, my sort of day to day plan has sort of gone out the window in the sense that when I used to previously go to work, I used to have a set plan of what I was going to do. So for instance, I might do pain clinic in the morning and anaesthetise in the afternoon. Whereas now we go in and we don't know where we're going to end up. So some of my colleagues have had to do transfers from London to Newcastle in order to move patients up there because they've run out of beds here. So you could end up in Newcastle if you went to work. So that's, <laughs> not, that's, not, that's not usual. Um, from a work perspective, we've very much had to diversify as a, as, a, as a cohort. So our pain services have unfortunately had to be put on hold during this time because our skills are required in within the hospital itself. So um, we've been looking after COVID patients from, you know, to the, from the point of them coming into hospital to them getting worse and requiring intubation. So we've been managing that. We've been moving patients to intensive care, managing patients on intensive care, turning them over if they required it. Uh, so, so that's been the intensive care part. I've also had to diversify what I normally do. So normally I would I would never be seen in the obstetric units in our in our hospital, but I've ended up there where I've helped um, babies being delivered, putting epidurals in people's uh, backs just just to help them through um, the last part of their pregnancy. 
So it's, it's been very chaotic, but very sort of um, the, the teams have been very bonded and it's brought, sort of brought a new spirit, I suppose, to the to the organisation where you just got, you've just got to work in a, in a team to get thing get things done. I mean, and they have been negatives. Uh, I suppose I've had uh, my wife is shielding, so when I do go to work, I have to stay away from from her. So I, I often end up spending a lot of time at the hospital and not coming home. Uh, so there's a family sort of give there, mm. I suppose, for that for that particular aspect. So, and it's, it's I suppose emotionally it's a little bit hard. You see some things that you've never ever seen before, never think you'd be part of, and it's sort of being able to sort of cope with that yourself as well. So all of those aspects of come to fruition during this time wow well, firstly thank you so much for everything that you've been doing for the entire country this last year i'm sure everyone is f- fully behind you in this um so you said that your pain work had stopped so are you going to be seeing a backlog or how are you dealing with that is that now digital services that you're offering or what's the kind of effects for people that require those meetings so specifically for pain consultants, um, during the first wave, we also had to stop our services. And during that time, we were, we, 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 there is from having four or five people deal with, with pain cleaners, now one person dealing with it and sort of troubleshooting what, what, what's going on. So there is still some access there, but it's very limited in that aspect. The, uh, and I suppose the big change is that everything has gone virtual as well. So even in between... Um, the first wave and the second wave, we were doing all our clinics either by phone or virtually. So, you know, patients weren't having to travel, they weren't having to come into hospital, which is great, I think, mm-hmm. for, for the patients and doctors, and still get the care that they required. I suppose what's really going to be hit a little bit is the fact that when you do procedures on a patient, then actually that the backlog for that has increased because... Yeah. A, we're still putting patients for procedures. What we could do previously during a list um, has to, has had to cut down because people have to get COVID tested. It takes a little bit longer to clean in between cases. So that the amount of time we have in theatre has decreased uh, while there are still patients requiring procedures. If someone really needs a procedure, so cancer pain patients or something, we're still able to do them, but they're sort of very much ad hoc uh, rather than continuously so I, th- I think eventually once we're through this there will be a little bit of a waiting list to see uh, pain patients or probably throughout the whole NHS and I suppose yeah. we're going to have to manage that but it's it's going out one fire into another fire yeah. um, during, during this time uh, at the moment so so for your um, and... sorry for your fibromyalgia patients in particular um, obviously <clears throat> this year we've had added kind of stress confined lifestyles things which are traditionally triggered anyway for um, this pain condition, are people reporting that their pain levels are worse than usual or do you think you will see more people complaining about, um, not complaining, but reporting these um, pain conditions because of what's, because of the last year and the stresses it's put people's bodies under? Yeah, I think, I think there has been you know, a lot more stress. I suppose everyone's... Uh, well, we're in the new year, so hopefully everyone's diet is continuing, but, you know, controlling your diet and controlling how much you're allowed to go out and how much you're al- allowed to exercise, all these things are really important for everyone's sort of mental health and, and well-being. And unfortunately, uh, you know, I probably quite agree with you that those things, unfortunately, are going to go up, the amount of people who are going to be stressed and their um, lifestyles have had to change with kids at home while they're trying to <laughs> trying yeah. to work. It's a it's a little bit difficult uh, during these times. So I think building your your coping mechanisms is really important during these times. So it's an opportunity to actually do that and readdress these things and have a different sort of um, focus on, on, on those things. So learning how to manage your stress a little bit better, even though there's probably more of it, uh, you know, through methods of, you know, yogic breathing, building up your parasympathetic part of your brain, um, trying to be as good as you can with your lifestyle, so eating more fruits and vegetables, trying the anti-inflammatory diets, trying to eat less red meat, trying to eat less meat, trying to go less dairy, you know, sort of take away all the nice things that you're probably doing all the time or trying to compensate with uh, food at the moment. Yeah, um, make January even worse than usual. 
yeah exactly <laughs> exactly so we've got to we've got to be able to uh, I feel like I'm the bearer of bad news on, on all fronts but I, I think just being a little bit more, more mindful of that and um, buying some gym gear to sort of do at home <laughs> even if you can find any yeah um, <laughs> I was at, actually I was out just put in between lockdowns and I was actually queuing for a running shop and I said this lady came by she says is this the queue for the running shop and I'm like yeah it's really sad isn't it that we're queuing to yeah. go to, you know, <laughs> to buy some trainers so I think it's got to that sort of stage I mean at least it shows everyone's trying trying to exercise even if yeah. everything's staying in the box <laughs> yeah exactly exactly so that was that was pretty funny it's in time so depending on where you live you can access certain services. Um, we've got to stay active I think we, you know that responsibility falls to us a little bit in the sense that we try and go out once a day if we're allowed to and try and do a walk as long as we don't get caught drinking coffee in a park or, or something like that um, we and I think uh, you you've probably got to take a little bit more responsibility to do a little bit of meditation I've started meditating every day uh, because I just know you're going to have a very stressful day so kicking off the day like that I've got, an, I've got an exercise plan, so if I had to buy a watch in order to sort of make sure that I can mm-hmm. try and get out or just remind me or motivate me a little bit more in order to be able to do these things. Uh, and there is help out there with regards to physios and psycho- psychologists. So our, our team, particularly at the hospital where I work, have all gone virtual as well. So they, they are seeing patients, be it a little bit slower than previously, but uh, that support is out there if things go a little bit haywire. Um, and, you know, we all know that there's no real treatment for fibromyalgia, yeah. unfortunately. And so there's, um, you know, stress management ways. There's certain medications that can help if there is an exacerbation. And there are psychological inputs that you, that you, can, that you can try and do, trying to improve your sleep, improving your diet. Mm-hmm. You've just got to become a little bit more, more, more mindful of, of oneself and... Uh, uh, and just having to take a little bit more responsibility on what's what, what, what's going on in your body and reacting to it. And it's very difficult and it's very hard. Um, in terms of say, in terms of say diet then, what kind of things are you, do you normally recommend to people? Are there any kind of key go-tos that you would suggest? I mean, I've done a lot of reading about this and I... And I can't say I adhere to this um, 100% myself, but I, I know the knowledge and it's, tr- it's trying to get there. But I think I think individually there'll be things that do cause inflammation in the body. Uh, and that, that may manifest as pain or it may manifest as a little bit of an upset tummy or you're just not feeling quite clear-headed as you normally would. Uh, and things that are really affect that are sort of dairy products, gluten, um, red meat meats in general, pro, you know, what type of protein you're yeah. getting. So moving more towards a sort of plant-based diet, um, cutting out the dairy, using oat milk instead of normal milk. Um, I, I feel like I'm, t- I'm when everyone... Everyone's All the all good stuff. Less, and everyone's <laughs> saying, oh, I need, to, I, need, I need some chocolate or something. It's, you know, doing those little things in moderation, but actually trying to move towards that. So slow behavioural changes uh, with regards to that. And then... And, you know, it's a long-term commitment and it's, it's not, it's not going to happen overnight and the benefits don't happen overnight. It's, you've got to do it for about 12 months mm-hmm. to sort of get any benefit. And, that, and that's the same with physio and exercise. It's, uh, everyone wants re- results in the next month or two, but actually it's, you have to commit to it very long term and knowing how to motivate yourself and knowing how to achieve your goals is very much something I try and do in my patients but it's also having that agreement with your with yourself in order to say, look, okay, understand that this is these things can cause issues, um, and I'm going to do I'm going to help do something about it. I mean, I, ha- I have lots of fibromyalgia patients, and yeah. some of them have done this and go, hang on, all that happens, doctor, is I lose weight. And that, you know, <laughs> it's a fair point, but sometimes that that's what you can need help. to do. And you know, losing a kilo can actually decrease the pressure in your joints by four times. And that's that's a significant fall. In, is in the is there a link the then between being overweight yeah. and having a chronic pain condition? Uh, being overweight and co- having um, 
pains in certain areas, yes, it, it, it can affect your knees, your ankles, etc. So for every kilo that you lose, that just decreases the amount of weight going through those joints and therefore um, they have to have less pressure in and therefore the, they should start to hurt less if you're able to achieve those weight loss gains. Obviously, we're living kind of a more confined lifestyle now. So actually getting out and about is a bit trickier and people are maybe reaching for kind of comfort foods a bit more. Are you kind of having to be even more encouraging and kind of stricter with people in terms of their management plans? I, I, I'm, I'm sort of not being stricter. I think that's, um, you know, it's a, it, it's a shared policy between myself and me. I'm not, I'm not telling you what exactly to do. Mm-hmm. I, I think you're having to sort of give more advice. I think everyone's mindful that their waistlines have probably got a little bit bigger <laughs> during this time. And just walking down the street, you can see the amount of alcohol that people are consuming because <laughs> yeah. it's just gone up. You can just see when the recycling bins come out. You, you, know, you can just you, you notice the difference. But yeah, I, th- I think you just have to be a little bit more mindful that you you're more likely to go down that road, aren't you, right now, and sort of try and wean back or say, look, if I'm going to do that, I'm going to have to do this first. And it's having to do something first before you reward yourself, rather than the other way around, which is what you suppose I suppose you have to really manage. Yeah, and it's just educating more, isn't it, to pe- for people to understand this because there's a lot of other news out there about about what's good for you and what's not good for you it's really hard to decipher exactly what to do it's really difficult even for myself as a professional when I'm going through things I, you know I do say oh this is a bit of nonsense and I have to delve deeper or I find something that I really believe in and I and I have to really have to sort of sing hard about it in order to get it get anyone to move forward with, with, with those particular advances that I think are there um, in terms of sleep then, because obviously that's kind of play a big part, people not being able to sleep or um, having interrupted sleep. So what kind of methods of relaxation or meditation do you normally suggest or advise? So sleep wise, I would say that meditating earlier in the day is a really good idea. And oh, why is that? So I think it, it, it's like kicking off your day. So if any... It, putting your baseline stress levels lower and therefore if anything stressful does happen then actually you would finish the day on a less stressful level than you otherwise would ideally if you could do it twice a day that would be brilliant and then just not drinking coffee after 2 p.m or any caffeine which which again is really hard Mm -hmm. staying away from alcohol actually because it actually disturbs your sleep Uh, sleeping medications can actually have the opposite effect so you can take them short term, but if you have some benzodiazepine sleeping tablets long term, so more than two or three weeks, then actually they start to affect the way that you sleep. So they make your sleep worse, actually. So they help you fall off to sleep. But they're not very good at keeping you asleep. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, having a cool room, making sure it's comfortable, not doing anything else in your, in, in your sleeping room is really important. If you can't go to sleep, go downstairs. Go, go go outside the room, do something else, and then come back. And then having a regime, if you, you know, if you want, once you do get off to sleep, actually, what do you do? One of the things that I've found really effective is just counting backwards. Mm-hmm. From what number? <laughs> from, from, well, uh, uh, what, what, what meditation app was I using? I was, I was using a meditation app, and it starts at a 1,000, actually. I was, wow. I was using a well-known sleepy aid. Mm-hmm something to do with your head and some space <laughs> and um that that you know if you wake up in the middle of the night it gives you a little um little idea of how to get back to sleep and i think they just start you off on a thousand you just start counting back and before and before you know it you're back to sleep and I, just training your brain to be able to do that um and one of the other things is that actually is training the parasympathetic part of your brain. So your brain has two parts, the stressful part, which is going to be really going for everyone right now, the sympathetic part. And you actually have the parasympathetic part. And no one ever trains you on how to actually use this or how to manipulate it. And actually through through the way of best manipulating that is through breathing. My parents used to jabber on at me about this when I was younger. I didn't pay them any attention uh, because I just didn't, I thought, you know, there'd be a medicine that can sort that out. 
but the more I've looked into it, the more that we actually don't train that parasympathetic part of your of your brain. And the way of doing that is to is to deep breathe and vary your breathing, and training that particular part of your brain. You can build it up, but again, it takes time. So what's and that again, like? Yoga really breathing difficult. or? Yeah, there there are different types of, uh, of of yogic sort of breathing, um, different paces to go at, and th- that's what I've sort of started to advocate. And you know, uh, there's an easy test you can do. You can just lie down mm-hmm. in a quiet room and just listen to what your brain's telling you, and you'll be shocked at how what all those thoughts that are flying around in your head, and it's actually being able to train yourself to go. Hang on. I need to be able, you know, I'm going to control those thoughts. I'm going to um, be able to understand where my brain's going or make it accelerate or make it de- 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 accelerate when I need it to. So, but that take that take, that takes years and it's a lot of, it's a lot of effort. And Where can people come. find these breathing exercises to practice? Are they in books, online? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's a really good book called The Healing Power of Breath. Uh, it's by Richard Brown and Patricia Gerbog, and that's what I've sort of you know I've, I've come across it's highly rated on Amazon as well and that's what I recommend to patients to to sort of try what you know what works and don't get frustrated with it because it is frustrating to do because if you it's like training for a marathon I think if you haven't done any training and you try and run a marathon it's not going to happen it's going to hurt and it's going to be really yeah. so you have to sort of take baby steps with this and just build up to it and the goal for that is to relax the stressful side of your brain well, re- re- relax the part of your brain that fights stress, yeah. So it's sort of a calm, it releases all the calm chemicals in your brain. Got it. So, so aside from kind of lifestyle changes and traditional painkillers, we know that people turn to alternative remedies. And I know that yourself in particular, you are somewhat of an advocate for cannabis for medical relief. Yeah, so I, I um, my journey with cannabis I should say started sort of when I was younger when it was when I wasn't interested in it I saw it as a drug really and mm-hmm. it was other people who used to you know I knew what it smelled like but I never went anywhere near it because they were all just smoking it all the time and it was it had a bad image in my brain I suppose in my in my ideas and then being a being a pain doctor a lot of my um, colleagues call me a nurse because I often talk to patients and try and get you know to the heart of the matter and sort of understand them not only from a doctor point of view so, but sort of emotionally as well and just try and help that part of, of, of their management and through that sort of relationship you have with patients and it started to come out that actually a lot of patients were using cannabis to sort of uh, manage their conditions and they would they were telling you this Eventually, yeah. I mean, then, you know, I'd often ask, oh, do you use any drugs? And I'd say, no. I'm like, and then I'd ask, do you use cannabis? And then, yes, it's the only thing I've found that can actually help. And that's quite a common but, threat of saying it's the only thing that's actually helping. Yeah. So, you know, some patients would say, look, everything you're giving me, doctor, just doesn't work. And everything you're doing doesn't work. And this, this, this works. So I thought, hang on, I've got to sort of understand this a little bit more if so many patients are telling me this. You know, it wasn't one or two, it was, it was a significant amount. And then I went and asked my colleagues about how, you know, did they know anything about it? And we never get taught anything about it when we were at medical school. Mm-hmm. The endocannabinoid system didn't know. It's a shame to say not much about it until my pain exams, really, where then we understood that there were two particular receptors um, I, I remember getting asked about it in my exam, actually. <laughs> really? <laughs> so it just, yeah, brings back hot flutters of sitting there getting getting the exam. But I clearly um, passed. Oh, well, yeah, well, thankfully, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, and so I just wanted to discover a little bit more. Mm-hmm. My, my colleagues weren't keen on it, as in they didn't know anything about it, so I had to go and find out for myself. And what kind of year are we talking? Are we 10 years ago, 5 years ago? been about 5 years ago, 5, 6 years ago now. And there was no, there was limited information out there. And, you know, we've got a little filter at home to stop uh, kids looking at anything. And you type in cannabis and it blocked it straight away. (laughs) (laughs) So I had to, I had to sort of work through that as well. I mean, but what I'm trying to say is that that prejudice was there. And and you have to work, you have to work through all that. 
And I suppose the, the other thing I do is I, I deal a lot of, I um, deal with a significant amount of cancer pain as well. Mm. And I always get to the end of what's available and I'm thinking, well, what else? There's got to be something else that can possibly help here. And so that's, you know, I went out and researched it, made links with doctors in California and in Canada and just started speaking to them about what their experience was because it's been legalised there for a number of years. Yeah. Then they were telling me, look, it's not the, it's not a wonder drug, but it has a place within management of patients. And sort of that changed my mind uh, a little bit when a doctor sort of said it to me. And I'm, yeah, you know, and, and the patient saying it. And then the law changed here in November 2018. But there was still no real, um, there was no way of finding out about about it at all. I, though, everything was, again, still abroad. So I then had to have a structure for sort of trying to prescribe it because I thought, look, I need to find out about whether this works properly. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do it properly, so I joined a particular clinic and I've been with them for over a year now and probably one of the leading prescribers in the UK. Uh, And... I think it has a place. I think it has a place. And with, with the opiate crisis that's, that's going on and the long-term side effects of, of opiates and how they affect you, you know, there's got to be, you'd hope that there was an alternative. And, you know, you've got to find, and this does help certain people. And I think one of the things that really helps is sleep, actually. We were talking a little bit about earlier yeah. that people who find it difficult to sleep are actually finding benefit for it and asking colleagues suddenly or you get other doctors saying look I'm taking this CPD oil for this short yeah. and then well oh the last person I'd think of doing anything like that so that started to happen as well so for the uninitiated then how does it how does taking cannabis actually help pain can you kind of maybe explain the difference between smoking it using a CBD oil like how you would kind of navigate using this as a pain management tool I mean, the first thing to say is an unlicensed product for any of those indications that we're talking about, mm-hmm. which means that there's no hard evidence for its efficacy, so that the fact that it would work. And in light of that, it's really, it's, you know, no medical professional should say to you, it definitely works for this or it definitely works for that, because then, then we just, they're just not allowed to say that. I mean, at, at this moment in time, how would you how would you get CBD? I think there's two ways of getting it. Mm-hmm. Uh, one, well, three ways, I suppose. One is illegally. Um, and I think um, with lockdown, that avenue has been shut down quite a lot. I don't, I, I don't know why, but I'm, I think things are not coming into the country. But I think that's the, in inverted commas, traditional way of people consuming it would be through either vaping it or, or, or smoking it. Not that I advocate any of those methods. Yeah, just to be clear. <laughs> Yeah, just to be clear, <laughs> well, definitely not smoking it. And um, the, the other way of taking CBD is to buy an over-the-counter product, with, which is mainly CBD, mm-hmm. uh, or going to a licensed clinic. So all, all, the clinic, all the cannabis clinics have to be run or have to have a CQC registration. They have to be part of a regulatory body. They have to follow certain uh, um, certain methods and in, in, in the way they prescribe and prove that you've tried other methods before getting to it so that those are the three methods the difference is that between what you can get over the counter what you can get from a clinic is the, the thc content yeah. so thc is not allowed to be sold um with cbd on over the counter so from a pharmacy or from other health food shops or specialist cbd shops so for, for anyone who needs the THC, they'd have to come to, to to a cannabis clinic. So what is THC and what are the benefits of that for people who don't know? So T- THC is another cannabinoid that's produced from the uh, cannabis plant. And that's, um, I suppose, what causes the real high in patients. So what's happened on the, can I, can I say the street or on recreational cannabis is that it has a really high THC content and very low CBD content. So people are after the high and so it, it causes that. that that's a prob- THC has probably been researched a little bit more than CBD and we know how THC works a little bit more than CBD. 
and THC is thought to be the instigator of uh, pain relieving methods uh, of it, especially for neuropathic pain. And by neuropathic pain, I mean caused by nerves. Mm-hmm. So, uh, if you, if it, which would traditionally be treated with drugs like amitriptyline and gabapentin and pregabalin or duloxetine. So that's the main difference. So the the one you get on the high street doesn't have any THC in. Uh, what you can get from a cannabis clinic is either oil or flour, and that will contain some THC in it. Not most of the time. And that's what you would be prescribing. That's that, that's what I prescribe most of the time. For, for some patients, I have to be honest that sometimes CBD just works, and getting to a significant dose of that, uh, sort of a hundred or hundred and fifty milligrams of that does help uh, but those sorts of concentrations aren't available on, on sort of over the counter really yeah are there do you do you think any of the kind of over the counter options are like, good enough for pain management I, I suppose I, I, I think it probably you know you'd have to decide as an individual I think that if you were going to buy something, you've got to do research on it. So going to, um, it would be just checking the lab reports of the particular brand you're buying to make sure that they are what they say they are. The problem is that medicines are regulated by one regulatory body, the MHRA, which means they are treated as medicines. Mm -hmm. So what it says on, what it says it is, it has to be. Whereas at the moment, and this is going to change in the future, where, um, if something says it's five percent CBD, then it may be it, it can be within a certain range. There are some brands that are you know are very stringent about what they do, and you know I'd be looking for something like that if I was if I was going to just sort of try it. Uh, yeah, and people use it for a variety of things. Yeah, I mean I've been eating that. one for sleep, but there's def- there's definitely just a difference in the strength I found. Basically, the stronger it is, the more likely I am to be knocked out. <laughs> well. You know, it affects people differently as well. And so that's, that's good to hear that you're able to manage your sleep like that. <laughs> My pharmacist who I talk to uses it for his knee pain. Yeah. Um, uh, I know other people who spray it on and use it for shoulder pain. So it's just, you know, people have found uses for it without even being directed towards yeah. it already. Um, do you still think there's quite a bit of stigma around people using this medically? Yeah, I think there's still a lot of stigma there. I, I mean, when I first started prescribing, although I was getting a lot of my patients off to sleep, it was keeping me up at night <laughs> because I, you know, I was very worried about how my peers would 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 look at me and uh, and think about it. But I sort of, at the beginning of the year, I'd seen enough benefit in my patients to sort of say, "Hang on, there's something in this that you need to know about. You need to understand it. You need to talk to your patients about it, and we need to know what it is." And so I've been running courses for doctors. Uh, probably one of the first to run it uh, with regards to chronic pain and cancer pain so uh, sorry chronic pain and uh, cancer pain and particular cannabis and how it sort of interacts educating them about what medicines are available at the moment and how they do or don't work and how to move how to move patients forward um and i think the, the stigma is out there both from not only doctors, but I think from just general society as well, with regards to using cannabis or marijuana to to, to treat this. I mean, uh, I, I think the stigma is changing, but it's it's definitely still out there. Where you probably can't be honest with your family if you were taking no. it, or or you know, if the police see you with it, then it's still you or your neighbours see you with it. I'm sure you just wouldn't really go around singing about it initially, but. What about this? Was there a new scheme introduced at the end of last year? The green card scheme? Is that like the kind of card? The kind of card, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I think they've started to. They haven't actually launched any cards yet. I'm not, you know, I'm really, I'm really not too familiar with it. But those cards are coming out in order to protect patients to say, look, actually, I'm getting prescribed medication. But actually, if you have a prescription, which any of the cannabis clinics should. Uh, sent to you after you've you, you've got it that's protection should be protection in mm-hmm. uh, itself to stop you from any particular uh, issues that may arise from 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 having it but you know kind of card is launching and i think it will be until it's more acceptable then i think it's a, a way of letting people know that actually you're you're being treated medically for with cannabis 
So currently, if you get a prescription, do you have to pay for them? Are they available yeah, so, in the NHS? So NHS-wise, I think they've only licensed um, Sativex for multiple sclerosis uh, and a CBD product for epilepsy. So they're the only two NHS indications. Mm-hmm. Um, most of these prescriptions are private prescriptions, so that's why they're not within the NHS. NICE hasn't approved it, so NICE haven't said that there's any evidence. That's hence why it's unlicensed um, uh, medication. So it has to be, you, you have to go out, unfortunately, and get it and get it privately. And I think, you really, were you asking about pricing as well? I mean, uh, as a doctor, I don't get too involved in pricing. I'm, I'm a prescriber, but, you know, you have to pay for the consultation, I suppose. Yeah. You have to pay for follow-up. And you'd have to pay for the products itself, be it either oils or be it flour. And on average, it's about, I think about between 30 and 50 mils of an oil is about 150 to 200 pounds. And so that seems pretty expensive. Now, sorry? That seems pretty expensive. Yeah, it is. It is, I suppose, um, for a medicine. But I th- the, the cost at the moment is probably relatively high and it will come down in the future. Uh, and I think for flour, it's around 130 to 150 pounds for about 10 grams, depending on... How, do, how does the flour work? Is that kind of something you put in a cake? <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't know about that. No, I think flour, you have to vape it. So you have to buy a oh. specific vaporizer, which is medically approved device so the mhra again have to sort of say that you can use it for this and then you and then you put it in that and then you just you, you just sort of have one puff or two that's more used for sort of breakthrough pain and it's sort of cancer pain patients who get a real instant real intense pain that sort of needs something that w- works very quickly and that works very quickly and uh, it kicks in and then re- relieves the symptoms uh, most of um most of the patients I see end up on oil and they they sort of they their improvement comes from there. So moving forward then, you're kind of you're currently kind of one of the leaders in this field. Do you see it becoming more mainstream? Are your colleagues kind of receptive to it? Like do you see it as a viable alternative to opioids? Yeah, I think you yeah. I think uh, that was a (laughs) two-part question, yeah. Uh, So with regards to my colleagues, yeah, my colleagues are getting a lot more on board, I have to say. I have to say that, again, they think that it is starting to have a place. Um, And they want to know how it works, and they want to know how to prescribe it. You know, that's fair enough. The the amount of doctors is going up that are are actually prescribing it. So that's that's very positive. Um, Sorry, what was the other part of the question? It was... um, do you see it as a kind of viable alternative to uh, opioids? Yeah. yeah. I, I, I think it, it, the real answer is it depends on what you're using the opiates for. You know, you shouldn't be using opiates for chronic pain. They can be used for acute pain. So if you break your leg and you need a little bit of morphine mm-hmm. for, for while you're there, long term wise, they shouldn't really be used. And often a lot of my time is taking patients off opiates, actually. A lot of my time is spent doing that. And you can present the the alternative. Sometimes people don't want help getting off opiates. They just want to stop. I mean, I've got some great stories. Um, mm-hmm. where people have just got off into, I wouldn't recommend this, but they've gone off and just weaned themselves off them by themselves very quickly and just taken it once once I told them to do it. Um, and some people need a little bit more help in order in order to be able to do it. But it normally takes a long time in order to do, in order to decrease your opiate intake. It, you know, it can be an alternative to help you through that. Um, through that period but you know what, you have to think about what your long term aims are what, what do you want to be able to do what do you want to be able to achieve that you weren't, be able, weren't able to do before and sort of build to that and it's one of the mechanisms in order to help that I think you have to mix it with physio talking to your mm-hmm. uh, pain doctor some psychology every, all, all of that coming together and then move you forward as an individual thing it's not as I say, it's not the be all and end all. It's part of the picture. Where would it normally come in your kind of recommendations? Would you kind of suggest people try changing their diet, their exercise regime first before you 
suggest kind of going down this route? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 again, I think I think it's all in unison. If you can do everything at once, that'd be great, uh, and um, and it motivates you more. You have to, in order to prescribe uh, medical cannabis, you have to have failed two other therapies. Oh, okay. and that's normally you, you say so yeah, two other licensed products. So you would have had to fail those first in order to get the um, in order to get a prescription. So you may have had to try amitriptyline or gabapentin or pregabalin previously. One of the two, the three there, uh, and then and then you're allowed to prescribe it. I think that was that. Does that answer your question? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it does. Um, okay, then. So, where do you see the kind of medical and cannabis bridge in the next kind of three to five years? Do you, do you think there's going to be a big change, or we're kind of going to stay in the same place that we are now? I think it's going to be little steps. Uh, I think that as cost comes down, more people will be able to access it, and I think that's a little bit of a barrier at the moment. There is there is um, a project out there that's trying to promote medical cannabis T twenty one. So I think that's that will, that may also change things, and. I think is you know the responsibility on doctors that are prescribing at the moment is to do it correctly, uh, and sort of build evidence for it in certain conditions. And as that evidence starts to be formed, then uh, the people above us are going to have to sort of start to listen to to the the benefits of it in whatever conditions uh, it, it seems to help. So. I, th- I think it'll be baby steps. There won't be anything big in the next three to five years. I think, we'll, and then if, if that's done correctly, then I think it will get bigger subsequently to that. So it should get easier and cheaper to be able to to access these products. Hopefully, in the years to come. So watch this space. Yeah, basically watch this space. Well, thank you so much for all of your insight and information. That was so interesting, um, and. I'm sure people are going to be trying to do their research into this space. If people are looking for um, like ways to get kind of access to research, is there anywhere, any kind of papers or anything available online? Um, are there any... I suppose if, if, if there are any specific conditions um, that you are looking for, then we can I can sort of direct you to those pages. I mean, uh, sorry, I'll have to... Um, I'll have to think about that one. If you want specific papers for for cannabis, I don't know actually. So we'll have to do that after next. We can put time. that in the show notes or next time. Yeah, yeah, we'll put it in the show notes. That's probably fair. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much for that. Um, it was great chatting to you, and have hope it goes okay on the wards. Yeah, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed it gets better with all these lockdowns. So yeah. <laughs>